pleasure of combining travel with a historic book called Between the World and Me. This book is by the acclaimed journalist, writer, MacArthur scholar, ta Coates. It's a novel <clears throat> which a father writes his memoir to his son about his experiences of being a black man in America. Yet this book goes beyond ta personal experience and it interweaves the historical patterns of white supremacy, assaults on African Americans combined with, a social, with social justice poetry. The most influential poet in Mr. Coates' work is James Baldwin's work. Each poem and story throughout the book demonstrates how African Americans were historically and continue to be attacked and used as an economic engine which is embedded in the social, political, and economic fabric of America. Throughout his book, he uses the term the black body. We struggled with that term initially. We couldn't figure out what does the black body mean. And one day I heard it heard during an interview. It was a term that came from a lecture he heard while he attended Howard University. His professor presented the history of the exploitation, rape, and abuse on the black female body by white supremacists. The term the black body is used in his book because he argues that the historic and current killings, hangings, rapes, and abuse on black men and women by a system of white supremacy will never see the humanity of African Americans. Instead, the black body throughout history has been objectified. Ta-Nehisi's Ta evidence of such objectification permeates throughout history, throughout our American history. Starting with slavery, 100 years of Jim Crow, segregation, mass incarceration, housing discrimination, and redlining, all of which influences the problems we have today, external and internal, from police brutality, black-on-black -black violence, and archaic systems in place designed to maintain status quo. Notwithstanding this bleak experience or our history, ta had a chance to reflect deeply about America when he and his, live, his family lived in Paris for a year. This deepened a critical analysis of his lens and perspective on American society. It's harsh, it sounds dark, it sounds deep, but it's real experience and it's our history that we all play a major role in healing. The ability to travel overseas is a privilege. It affords us the opportunity to grow, expand our knowledge about the world and ourselves. For African Americans, it is a way to grow and thrive beyond our imagination. In honor of ta Coates, the book Between the World and Me, I would like to start off with a poem that captures how African Americans live their lives. As we thank our ancestors for making the sacrifice for us to be here today. This poem is Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. Well, son, I tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I've been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back because you find it kind of hard. Don't you fall now for I's still going hep, honey. I still climbing and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. We know 
that being students, life for you has not been a crystal stair. Yet, somehow, you have this thirst and knowledge and desire to travel. You had courage. It took courage to do that, and you did it. Our first theme is to focus on growing up as an African American and family culture. I'll start with a quote from ta book. I watched you leap and laugh with these children you barely knew. And the wall rose in me, and I felt I should grab you by the arm, pull you back, and say, we don't know these folks. Be cool. Now, when I measure this fear against the boldness that the masters of the galaxy imparted to their own children, I am ashamed. Mr. Coates realized, like so many African-American parents, that they desperately want to protect their children from the ills of our society. I'm curious. Growing up, and this is to the panelists, what message did you receive from your parents about being African-American and about race? you like to start? Linda. Well, myself personally, um, growing up, uh, my siblings and I were the first generation here in the North. Our parents came in here directly uh, in the late 40s from the South. All of us was born here in the North. And they carried with them a sense of pride, a sense of uh, wanting more, not only for themselves, but for, for their children, their siblings. Uh, they were the first ones here, so they allowed their siblings to come behind them. So there was always family members that lived with us uh, so they can get simulated into the Northern culture. So that's always been a part of my existence, uh, a part of what's my core in regards to reaching out, helping, uh, bringing others forward so not only uh, we in our, at our moment can achieve, but also those who are coming behind. So that's a very significant part of my existence. Okay. Thank you. Cindy. Uh, for me, my parents always tried to give me like a foundation of who I was being an African American. I think they were really good because they kind of prepared me for what um, I would know my life to be. Uh, they made me play all these games about like, like instead of playing Monopoly, I would play games like who is this famous black or famous African American inventor? And I'm like, what am I playing this for? <laughs> but um, as I grew older, the foundation that they laid for me really helped me to see who I was in the perspective of the world of people who weren't black and how I was treated, but that I could still feel pride in my history and not be ashamed and be, be proud of what I came from, what we came through, as opposed to having shame. Um, so they, they laid a good foundation for me, um, just educating me about who I was as a black person. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. For me, um, my parents really never put me in a box. Um, yes, I, they, they told me who I was. I knew where I came from. But unlike the book, um, it wasn't quoted to me daily. My mother and father made sure that I experienced life at its best. I had the privilege of traveling at a young age. I had the privilege of going out with my family, trying different foods, not just what I knew to be soul food. I ate sushi at a young age. I ate Greek food. I had a chance to eat Mediterranean, all different types of food, Ethiopian, just so that I know that the sky was the limit for me. So for me, growing up, I never seen, my, seen myself as, oh, I'm African American, and so the limit is here. I, I just said I'm a person, I'm an individual, and I can do whatever I can do because that's what my parents instilled in me. They didn't say, oh, you're a black girl and you can only do this. They said, you are an, an individual and the sky's the limit. So that's how I, I grew up. Thank you. 
For me, it was uh, it was totally the opposite. Um, my mom, she was single, and uh, it was 11 of us. Uh, so in the household, we, she pretty much did all she could to take care of her, take care of us the best way she could. Um, so certain things that she really didn't know because she really wasn't taught. So I pretty much got a lot of information off television and uh, reading a couple of books and you know going to school and listening to the history. And it kind of gave, uh, gave me a good perspective on which direction that I should take as far as becoming a, ma a black African-American man. So um, I pretty much just learned as I, you know, as I went. And, you know, it was, it was kind of tough, but, you know, my mom always said she loved us and she always wished that we had the best. Um, but she, she worked so hard. She went from walking to a, a sewing factory to uh, working at a hotel and she did the best that she could to take care of us. And so from that, seeing my mom work that hard, it gave me a drive to want more, not just for myself, but for her also. So to this day, I'm actually pursuing for better. So. And this is interesting. These, this is a married couple. These are the Brookins, mm -hmm. for your knowledge. OK, Kaya. For me, my mother's family was from the South. Some of them were runaway slaves, and um, as time went by, they were a part of the great migration that migrated up here, my grandparents were. Um, my mother was one of seven, and so all, mostly all boys, her and my aunt were the only girls, and so my grandfather carried a lot of racially historical trauma with him moving up here, which in it, which eventually um, embedded itself within our family. It wasn't something that was spoken about. You didn't need to know that you were black, you just knew it. And it was often indirectly taught that although we were black and we could be whatever we wanted to be, there also was a limit to how far we could get because we were black. Um, and that is something that it has stayed with me um, in every moment that I have as a black woman, every success in pursuing higher education and being a mom, all of those are things that I take with great confidence and I'm, I'm extremely grateful because it's not something that a lot of people in my family were able to experience. And as a single mom, it's extremely important that I want my children to know that. Thank you. Um, one thing that I could say about growing up as an African American is that my parents, they never put me in a box either. Um, and the way I grew up, I had encounters with um, multiple races. Um, so I was never taught to because I'm an African American, I should act a certain way or I should be a certain way. What I was taught was more like a projection, like because you're an African American, you have to work harder because of what went on in the past in, in America. The image of a black man is not that positive. So you always have to prove yourself to other races that you're not what you thought I was when you saw me on TV. So. That is kind of like how I was brought up. Well, my experience, both my parents came from the South, one from Arkansas, one from Alabama. And when they met here in Chicago, uh, you know, raising three kids, I'm the oldest of, of those three, instilling in me a certain understanding of my identity as well as responsibility. You know, I can remember my father always telling me, hey, no matter where you go, you represent me. And, uh, you know, that kind of fuels, you know, how I operate within the world. Um, I read a passage of scripture that says that he that wants friends must first show himself friendly. Mm -hmm. And just my understanding of that and what I was taught by my parents, I watched them model that in the environment that they came from, in the environments that they worked. You know, the coworkers that didn't look like us, 
were always inviting us to their homes because it was something that they left them with. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was a connection that was made. And that was something that I grew from. You know, we traveled just about every year as a child. And it didn't matter how much money we had, we just piled up in the cars and went somewhere. You know, so that was something that um, I wanted to make sure, you know, my wife Carolyn is sitting right there, you know, the two of us together wanted to make sure our children had that kind of experience as well. You know, we've, um, we've made sure that, you know, travel was a part of, you know, our developing as people and how we interact with other nations and other races and other groups of people is it, very important, it's, it's, it's significant. My favorite word is impact and it, it's because, hey, once we come in contact with one another, there's a transference or there's something that transfers and I would like for it to be a positive impact. Yes. You know, but that's something that was instilled in, in me from my parents and I'm passing it on to the next generation. These are the Masons father and son team. Regarding your personal feelings around travel, I'm gonna give you a quote and then we're going to talk about your experiences going abroad before you went. All right, here's the quote from Mr. Coates' book. It had never occurred to me to leave America, not even temporarily. My friend Jelani once said that he used to think of traveling as a pointless luxury like blowing the rent check on a pink suit. <laughs> How about if we start here? Mr. Brooks. Well, I kind of relate to his friend. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's the first thing that came to mind when my wife brought it up to me about us traveling abroad was uh, where the money gonna come from. <laughs> so uh, it took a lot out of me because in the midst of her wanting this and she wanted me wanted it for so long, for me it's been like uh, I was hesitant because of fear and me not actually, you know, been anywhere. So I kind of, you know, was kind of stagnated as far as making a decision if we should go or not, even in the situation of us, you know, in the process of purchasing a home. So I kind of made all these excuses why we shouldn't, but in the midst of the excuses, all I, you know, could say was that I was afraid. So it took courage and it took me to realize how far I, you know, how far we've came as far as having six kids and being so young and, you know, purchasing a home. So I had to, I had to think about that and I had to, you know, you know, just develop this courage to know that in spite of, it will be all right. And so I just took a leap of faith and just did it. Okay. Now, Catherine. Me was totally different. I had a travel bug and I was going and I was going. I was bringing him with me. I was like, you getting on a plane. <laughs> he had never been on a plane before. So that was one of his fears. And for nine years, uh, we've been together. And I was like, I've been on land for nine years. Look, I need to get in the air because I started traveling at a young age. My father took me uh, to Paris and I've been to Canada. I, I was just all over the place. And then once I got married, it was like land. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and so once I, uh, once I came to the department of OIS and they was like, we're going to Italy. I'm like, I'm going. I don't know how we're gonna do it. We didn't have a house. We were homeless at the time. Well, six kids. He was like, babe, we need to buy a house for us. I said, God gonna bless us with a house and a vacation. Let's go. And so <laughs> we got the house. We got the, we went to Italy and it's just been flowing since. So he has a travel book too. I'm like, I gotta get him somewhere else, maybe China. So he won't, you know, it won't lie dormant. I was absolutely terrified to go all the way to China, but something about me, it just, I'm compelled to face my fears. Like if I'm terrified of it, I have to do it. So like even me being on this panel, I have a fear of public speaking. So I'm like, okay, let me accept it. So I can just, just go ahead and get that fear over with. But I was also afraid too, because people say, oh, they don't like uh, black people over there in China. Oh, they're going to think you are ugly. They're going to say this to you. They're going to say that. People, you know, showing you videos of uh, like racist kind of media and that kind of stuff. But I was just like, I just feel like I have to see for myself. Like, I just have to know. And I went and 
um, it was amazing, but there was a lot of fear. I had a lot of fear, especially particularly being black. I remember being on the bus arriving to China and it was nighttime and nobody could really see me yet. I'm thinking, oh my God, in the morning, people are gonna be looking like, uh, what? Who is this random <laughs> black person? But I mean, there, there, they were looks, but it was, it was just totally a different experience than what people had told me. And so I'm so glad that I did push through that fear like, like you did with um, flying because you just, I feel like a lot of times as black people, people tell us you can't do this or people are gonna treat you this way, people are gonna say this, but I, I really feel like you have to just figure it out for yourself. Like you have to go, you have to push past the fears because people are really different. Like there's a lot of racism, but it's also a different time. And I got a chance to meet um, people who do think differently. Um, and just pushing past those fears and doing what people tell you that you can't do, even as a black person, but as whatever you are that people tell you you can't do. I feel like you really just have to push past those fears. For myself, uh, it's very similar to some here on the panel in regards to I traveled at a young age, but for different reasons. My, my parents, as I mentioned before, did come from the South. Um, the reasons, though, for coming were definitely for, because of oppression. My father was, he served in the Second uh, World War, and the, um, whom he served with, many were, their lives were taken not because of action, but because of where they were based in the South. So he promised himself that he would bring his family to a better area that they could have a, a chance. So by, by doing that, um, they, my, my family was not of means, but there was plenty of love. So we didn't get to travel as a family, but because uh, they kept us in environments of opportunities, we had opportunities to travel because of our successes as, as youngsters. So because of academics, I was able to travel at an early age. And I, I loved it. I, I started flying in the 70s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get over the fear of flying pretty early. And uh, I traveled throughout the time I was in corporate America. I'm, I'm a non-traditional student, so uh, I have a love for learning. And my reality of my career was constant overseas travel and domestic travel. Mm -hmm. But as a student, the reason why I decided that I wanted to travel is because the first opportunity I had was um, marketability based. It was, my, it was my industry, it was for uh, health care in a foreign country. So I can bring it back to a benefit for myself. But while I was in that meeting, I met Amy in our international department <laughs> and found out about Nicaragua, which was the complete opposite of why I was traveling for the purpose of, uh, uh, a purpose for myself, but it was to serve. And I fell in love with the opportunity to be able to travel elsewhere and to serve my global community. So, and after returning, I realized that there's not a lot of student study abroad travel. There's only, from what I'm realizing from looking it up, there's only approximately 15% of students in higher ed that travel abroad. And of that, there's only approximately 4.6% that are African-American. Exactly. And that's why this panel is so important because the African-American population of students are the least likely to travel abroad. We're gonna continue this question about perception. Akai, what was your first perception about traveling abroad? I entered the military <laughs> when I was 19 um, and I deployed right after basic training. So um, I went to Iraq and that was my first international experience. Wow. Now as a kid, I was extremely uh, <coughs> obsessed with, uh, what is the channel, a ge geographic channel. So I al always, always wanted to go internationally. But then also looking into the media it had a really huge impact on how I looked at international travel. So during um, my time in Iraq, and I deployed, there were good experiences and there were bad ones. But one of the good experiences that I learned was that 
It was not what everyone told me it was. It was not what I saw on TV. It was not what I saw on the news. And that kind of like peeled off that bandaid. I was like, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> so when I, just, when I got out of the military and I came back here, I said, okay, I'm black. And everybody that's black is going to Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Canada. I need to go where I see some other black people. Africa is it. I went to Amy's office. I was like, I want to go to Ghana. I want to go to somewhere in Africa. She said, where do you want to go? I don't care. Long as it's in Africa, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. And I called my sister. My sister was living out of state. And I said, I'm really, really scared. I said, I know that it's not going to be what I think it is, but I really, really hope that it's not what I think it is, but I still want to go. And she was like, but what if something happens? You have kids. Well, you know, they say on the news that when you go to Africa, they hold people for ransom. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> we have to have faith that this is going to go through. And so I have an 11 year old son. And I remember telling him I was going to Ghana. He was like, you can't go to Paris. People, my friends said their parents go to Paris and their parents come back. Can you just go somewhere else and not go there? I was like, no. And I promise you, when I come back, I'm going to show you so much things that you're going to want to go. You're going to want to go. And when I came back, that was exactly. Now he, every year since I've been back, I've, this is my summer after I went last summer. And he's like, so when are we going to go to Ghana now? When are we going to Ghana? So it's definitely not, um, I was, I was, I was very apprehensive. And even some of the um, concerns from training in the military about being aware of your surroundings. I was a little skeptical of all of those, but it was nothing like that. Once I got over there, it was completely the opposite. I would say that my concerns about going overseas. Well, first off, I did go to South Africa. Uh, we spent time in Cape Town and we spent time in Port Elizabeth. Um, so I didn't really have any big concerns about going to Africa. Um, I was actually really excited. Like I wanted to go to a place where for once you were the majority and not the minority. So I thought that that was pretty interesting. You know, when you go to Africa, people look just like me, you know, and I would go in the mall and they would speak to me in their native language because they couldn't tell the difference between if I was African American <laughs> or American. They didn't know. Everybody's black. So it just felt interesting to like, like you don't go somewhere and people look at you different. Because it's like if you're being here in America, you know, or just being even here in Chicago, you go in certain places as a black man, people look at you twice. But in Africa, you're the majority. So. Um, I didn't really have any concerns about going over there. It was a really exciting experience, and um, I would encourage everyone to go over there because nothing, nothing that they show you on TV is not all of that is really true, mm -hmm. you know. So you just got to see for yourself. All right, I have another question. I'm going to tie this into our last theme of reality of being abroad and coming home. And before I get to that question, Mr. Mason, I want to know what is it, thinking about ta memoir to his son, what did you want to impart to your son around travel as a father? When James expressed his interest in going to South Africa, you know, I was really excited about that. I wanted to, um, I saw the opportunity that I've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. He's one of four. Uh, my two daughters have been out of the country twice. Uh, and they went at a younger age. So I have two sons. He's the oldest of those two sons. This was his first opportunity. I went with them on their first opportunity. I wanted to make sure I was there with him on his first opportunity just to see how he uh, interpreted that experience or to, to assist with that. Um, you know, the study abroad package that we had was amazing. The things that we saw together, the, uh, the exposure that we had to uh, the nationals, the local people, was an amazing experience for a father and a son to share. And I, you know, I, I got a lot out of that book, you know, the exchange. Um, but just seeing him flourish in that environment, to see that brightness in him, 
as he experienced it. You know, I, I've, I've been looking for that light. <laughs> and that was an experience that had to happen there. That's not something, you know, he, he's very energetic and he's aggressive in developing into the young man that he is. And he's got vision for his future. But I wanted to be there to watch that light come on. Mm. And I was very excited to see that. Um, I got a lot of praise as a father from the people that came in contact with him before they met me. You know, they, they expressed their, you know, their <laughs> impression of him. You know, so, um, you know, that, that's something I'm definitely thankful for. I'm looking forward to my younger son having his first experience. Uh, and that, that's priceless. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Coming home, the reality of being there, we've heard a number of things about the experiences of being abroad and it not being what we perceived it to be. This is a caption about Paris from ta Coates. It, Paris, recalled New York, but without the low grade, ever present fear. The people wore no armor or none that I recognize. Side streets and alleys were bursting with bars, restaurants, and cafes. Everyone was walking. Those who were not walking were embracing. I was feeling myself beyond any natural right. I walked outside and melted into the city like butter in the stew. James started already and talked about how he blended in and he felt very comfortable in South Africa. Akaya, I am curious about being a woman in Ghana and a single woman in Ghana. What was it like for you? Extremely easy to see all the men with their shirts off. <laughs> so, um, okay. <laughs> it actually it was it was pretty it was it was extremely interesting because um, once I got over there, that was one thing that I was very um, a little apprehensive about because I know that they have very strict um, perception of how they think that men and women interact and relationships as far as community. So once I got there, I said, um, you know, they told us that, you know, certain clothes you shouldn't wear, you know, they're a very conservative society. So I was extremely worried. Even though I wore pants, I was like, these are skinny jeans. What if I offend someone? They're gonna be upset. What if a man thinks that I'm disrespecting his culture? I'm making women look bad. And they actually understood. They were just like, oh, you're, you're American. You don't, you know, but it's okay. Long as you don't have any skin showing, then it's, then it's fine. Um, as, as, a, as a female, um, I did notice that some of the women, especially once they noticed that I was American, they were actually very interested to know what life was like in America as a black woman. And they, how is life over there? Um, I, I, we see things on TV. Is it, are you rich? Do you live in a mansion? Um, do, do you have a husband? Does he drive a really expensive car? What do you do? And I was like, I'm just, I'm a student. I'm a veteran. I'm a single, single? You're single, you're not married? Um, so it was very interesting to see that not only do, do we have perceptions about what life is over there for them, but they have the same too. And it was interesting to sit down with them and have conversations about what it's like to be black in Africa versus what it's like to be black in America. So for me, that was the best experience. I don't think if I was a guy, it would have been as great because the guys are, they don't, they're, they weren't as, um, Communi they, they didn't communicate as much as the women. Most of the women, uh, the men th didn't know that I interacted with, they didn't know English very well. So I think that was a barrier for them as far as me being able to communicate with them. But a lot of the women knew English very well, so it was easier for us to have like really great conversations about what life was like. Now, if you were a guy, a black man in Africa, you probably would not have returned home. <laughs> <laughs> they are treated royally. <laughs> yes, they are. Somebody said, hmm. <laughs> yes, they are. Linda. Yes. 
What was it like on the grounds in Nicaragua? It was an amazing experience. Uh, being in a Central American country, to be able to, to serve a, a community with basic public health needs. We were a, a unit of females both time. We formed sisterhoods. And we did a very hard work. We built latrines for uh, several families. We laid concrete in their, their um, homes. The, uh, quite what we take for granted may be the similarity of a size of perhaps our bedroom. Uh, some families had maybe seven members, three generations of members in there and they uh, were very proud people that were very uh, welcoming. Mm -hmm. They welcomed us into their society to come there to uh, help them. And let me rephrase that, not so much help them, but partner with them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because what we did was far, it absolutely is not uh, any form of charity work mm -hmm. of any sort. Uh, the community members contribute as, as a, a holistic environment, and they help each other within their community. What we, we noticed uh, in the first community, the first year that we served, that they uh, were extremely happy in their environment. They have very limited um, uh, resources in regards to what we consider the norm of how we live. They, they had uh, water supplies that was very far away. And they would uh, share a horse that uh, was public domain pretty much that would haul the water up the, the mountainside and share it amongst the village. There were very few that had electricity, but the community pulled together to make sure they may have been two or three uh, once, like I mentioned, bedroom-sized homes that had electricity. And what they did was they had a refrigerator in those two or three homes that the full community shared. And the community, what we found out, the community helped pay for, for that electrical. So um, it was a blessing to be able to be there, uh, to be able to serve those communities, and, and they, um, it was just an experience that, that um, you would have to probably experience for yourselves, uh, which hopefully you, some of you do take that opportunity to experience. January. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cindy, when you reflect on the history of Af the African American experience, how do you believe traveling affects the quality of life? of a person and their family and their community? I love that question. Um, I think it would affect African Americans so positively, like, because you just, you have to, like I said previously, you have to find out about the world for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that goes with anything I feel in life. We just have a lot of stuff on us, I feel like, as Afri I'll speak for myself as an African-American woman, there's a lot of things that's put on you as regards to looks, the way you're supposed to act, the way you're supposed to be. But I really loved just discovering the world for myself. Um, even in uh, what you were mentioning earlier about how your parents told you you have to reflect positively on them and that kind of thing, I'm kind of discovering that Although I'm proud of who I am as a black person, I shouldn't have to be this way because I'm a black woman, I personally feel. Um, so I just really think it's important to just be able to be free, travel where you want, face those fears, and really just break free of all that stuff that people tell you that you have to be and you have to do, the way you have to look. Um, even some of the things that you feel are important to you as a black person, when you go over to, or even just as a, an American, when you go and travel, it's like, what was I even worried about? You know, I had a, a suitcase um, that had to last for three weeks. I had one suitcase. 
there was no, no washer machines. You know, I had to hand wash my clo uh, clothes. All the food that I knew, um, it was, n nothing was recognizable, nothing in China. I couldn't even, uh, supposedly I thought, I couldn't relate to a lot of things, but it didn't even really matter. Even, I find that even me being black, African American didn't matter in the sense of, um, like how people perceive black to be bad sometimes here. I, f I found that it was a lot about your nationality of being American and that perception of you. <clears throat> and that surprised me. I thought it would be like, people would be like, oh my God, like what are you and gross? And, but people are very curious to find out about you. Like it's not like a, oh my God. I, there was only one instance where somebody looked at me like, uh, <laughs> what are you? But everybody else was like, they looked at me like, like in awe or something, like it was a museum, like just turned their heads and like looked at me and was like asking <laughs> questions. And like when I would go into like makeup stores because I love makeup, they would be like trying to hurry up and try to show me these colors and that colors and show me what would look good on me. And I'm like, um, I don't think these will work for my skin tone. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was just amazing. I even got compliments. You know, people say, oh my, oh my God, you're so beautiful. And I was just like, what? Because everybody told me that in this country, in this <laughs> culture, I would be, you know, this or I would be that. So even on, I was riding the bus in China and a guy asked me, he thought I was um, African. He didn't know that there was any black people in America. He thought that all Americans were white. And we even had some, um, some Arabic people on the trip and they were just like, what, you're American? This doesn't make sense. So I also feel it's important because people don't really know us because we don't really travel, I feel like, as African-American people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really good for people to, mm -hmm. to see you and, and get to know you and just familiarize their self with you being a black African-American. So in reference to that African-American history, I think it's so important. I just think it'll enrich your life so much mm -hmm. to travel, even despite all the the benefits for you as a black person, just as a person in general, it's just amazing. You feel very fearless and powerful when you get back. Like, I feel like I could do anything just because I was able to just go to China. And it's just, it's a thing that will really impact you and change you. Like, I feel like a completely different person. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very, very important for everybody to have that experience, mm -hmm. it's, uh, especially if you're a black person, but everybody should have that experience. Thank you. That's a very, very, very important point mm -hmm. because it's hard to believe that other countries don't realize that America is really diverse and not predominantly white. Mm -hmm. That is similar to an experience I had in the village when I first went to a village in Sierra Leone. They looked at me very strange, like, how could it be? Mm -hmm. How could you look like us and not speak our language? Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, <laughs> we're, we're used to having white Peace Corps volunteers. And it took some time to adjust to know that there are a number of African-American volunteers, but there are few of us. And that's why it's important to travel abroad. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that you brought up the boldness when you travel, there's a fierceness that comes, your, your fearlessness mm -hmm. that comes about. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Brookins, okay. <laughs> how about, how has the two, of, now the, the parents traveling, how has that affected the family? Mm -hmm. the says, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork. So our children, they have a travel bug now because now they feel like mom and dad did it, we can do it. And we came home, we showed them pictures, we um, showed them our experience and say, hey, you can do this as well. And so our experience actually going to Italy, we put ourselves in a box. For three weeks, we were there. And for the first two weeks, we was like, nowhere without you. He like, I ain't going nowhere without you. <laughs> And so we were like, we were the only people on the trip that looked like us. We were the only African-Americans on the trip. When we got to where we were, our apartment in our area, we were the only African-Americans there. We were like, oh man, we, we in for it, you know. But after that second week, we realized nobody was paying attention to us. You know? they, didn't, they didn't care about our color. They was just like, you want some coffee? And you know, 
they were so embracing. They were so welcoming. They they talked to us like we were regular people. They didn't put uh, uh, any stipulations on us. And so that third week, we were like, we got on the, um, the train by ourselves. We, because at first, we was just sticking around Amy and the professor. We were like, where you going? <laughs> you going to do? We, we not, you know? Right. Amy, you know, with her way around. Amy, you know, speaks fluent Italian. It was like, oh, wow, you know? <laughs> but we, we got a chance to relax. We had to go grocery shopping. And we, naturally, we picked the items that we knew, like cornflakes, you know? Even though it was in Italian, we was like, I know that box. Let's get that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> right, let's get that one. <laughs> and so we, we did naturally get the things that we were accustomed to, but then like gradually we started saying, okay, what's that? It might be in Italian, but let's try it. Mm, this is good. Let's get it again. And so that third week we kind of got comfortable. We realized that we can get out, outside of our own box and we started traveling around the city on our own. So, As a husband, I, I had to show no fear, which mm -hmm. was kind of hard, <laughs> but uh, I had to, you know, which I'm so grateful that you know, the reason why we went was because of the leadership class. Mm -hmm. And the leadership class was teaching us how to be effective leaders. And uh, at that moment, well, when we was there, I was like, oh my God, I've never been anywhere. And here I am in another country. You know, I can't drive over the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm just like sitting there and... Uh, and I was like, you in, baby. Right. So we kind of <laughs> explained it to our children. And I kind of told my boys, you know, you got to had that push to move forward, but it was, it was great. It was yeah. great. Thank you. How do you think traveling affects your quality of life? I believe that my quality of life is affected knowing that I've had the opportunity and the experience to share, you know, the light and the life that God has placed inside of me. Um, you know, I like what the young lady over there said about feeling powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I took away from that was I was there because I belonged there. Mm -hmm. I was there because, and my son, we were there because we're supposed to be there, mm -hmm. not because someone allowed us to. We made those choices that got us into that environment. And it's, it's very important, you know, knowing that a lot of young men and young women that come from our community don't get off the block, mm -hmm. let alone out of the country. Yes. You know, that to me is significant. That is something that I would like to encourage as much as I can. You know, this generation, generation coming, you know, these young men and women, we need to take advantage of every opportunity available. Because we're not just competing with jobs or for jobs in this community. We're competing for jobs internationally. Globalization is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And it's got traction. And it's not gonna stop. It's important for us as African Americans, as Americans, as students in higher education to be taking advantage of every opportunity that we have to travel abroad. Yes, it develops our ability to lead. How can you, how can you lead somewhere you've never been? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to happen. You know, uh, so those challenges, recognizing that we're equipped to meet those challenges mm -hmm. and to prepare ourselves, you know, living a life of preparation for who we expect to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. I'm 51. And I got at least 30 more in me. <laughs> and I will be traveling every year with my wife there. Okay, and so my some children. of you are old. Can we have at least uh, 40 more years? <laughs> <laughs> at least 40, 50? Let's 50 more years. How about that? 50 more. About that? 50 more. Thank you. An exceptional panel, and we can go on. Uh, your experiences are incredible, they're rich, they're inspiring. And we're going to open it up to the panel. I mean, to the panel. So thank you. We're going to open it up briefly for some questions. And we're going to start off with Jerry. You have a question about traveling? Uh, hello, can you? Yeah, yeah think, we can hear you. <laughs> I think they can ask you questions I didn't wrote down. I'm going to ask again. Uh, I mean, great job. 
uh, ladies and gentlemen. That was a great job. I, I like literally was in your story when you was telling us, like, I've seen myself. So uh, my first question was, in, I think one of y'all answered, but it was in studying abroad, what is the rural view of, of the African Americans in the U.S. from cultures abroad that resembles African Americans? And I think one of y'all touched on that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to okay. that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know for me, uh, people just assume that you're African in China mm -hmm. um, because most of the people there are actually, are actually African. And um, it, that was even interesting too because even the African students would ask where you're from and you're like America and even they were like, oh, okay, okay, I'll, I'll see. But yeah, so um, I think with older, uh, in my part that I was in Hangzhou, with older Chinese people, they were fascinated by you. There was, um, I think they may have a more negative perception than younger people. Um, it's not, I didn't face any problems, but I could just see with my interactions it was like a, a bit of a standoffishness. Uh, with the younger people, because they're, uh, they kind of follow American trends, and a lot of American trends are like black culture. So I f it was more like, wow, you're so cool. That's what people thought. They were like, <laughs> it's so fascinating. Like, hang out. Here, here's a drink. They just really loved you because you were African American and you were black. So they thought you were more cool as opposed to like uh, negative which I mean could have its negatives too because sometimes people won't see you as a full rounded person. But um, yeah, it was, that was a perception. It wasn't too bad. It was really interesting though, mm -hmm. yeah. There was an interesting um, situation. We traveled to Scandinavia to the uh, Arctic Circle in, in uh, Estonia, to Lynn, Estonia and, and uh, also in Sweden. And on my behalf, I felt um, quite surprised because this was during the time when uh, there was quite a bit of, of travel of what would be considered immigrants from Syria. So as we were there, my expectations was that there would not be many that resembled me. And what we found in a predominantly uh, in a Scandinavian country and also uh, across in the Baltic because we went to, to uh, different areas in, in Scandinavia. And there were quite a few who looked like us. And you can tell the culture had been, um, I don't want to use the word impacted because often that may sound perhaps negative, but it, it, they were impacted in the sense of having an environment now that was quite uh, diverse in comparison to just a few years prior to that. I'm curious about the audience to see if there are any questions in the audience. Anybody had a question or a comment? Yes. Do any of you feel that you're getting, that you get pushback more so from your peers and family members when you travel abroad versus the countries that you've actually visited? Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, all majority of my friends are African, are black, and all of them did not want me to go. They were trying to figure figure out ways that I couldn't go. They were sending me videos every day, <laughs> um, pictures. I seen this on YouTube. You cannot go. And when I got there, um, one thing that I noticed was that as, as um, she said, when I got over there, they already assumed in Ghana that all Americans were rich. But they also had 98% of interactions with white Americans. So by me being a black American, they automatically assume that because they don't see us that often, that I was really, really rich. <laughs> Richer than white Americans. <laughs> so they were even more intrigued as to know how I, got, how I got there because we don't see many like you and the ones that we see, they are very important. So you must be important in America. What do you do? Do you work for the president or, you know? <laughs> And the students there don't travel internationally. That's not even something, that's not a trend there that they do traditionally in the student sector. So that was very interesting, but my friends were not, they were not perceptive to it. Um, and none of them have ever wanted to travel internationally. And if they do, they wanna tra travel to places that are not 
um, like Ghana. They want to go to Puerto Rico. They want to go to Vegas or Dominican Republic. They're not going to Africa, and they will tell you that. My daughter was in Accra, and she also went to another city as well. She was studying uh, public health, and she was, interestingly enough, I had a business with a customer that was doing business there, and she's an African-American woman, and she's extraordinarily wealthy. So I understand exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so my daughter was taking these unusual um, methods of transportation to get to a clinic. Tro, tro. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> with the helmet. <laughs> and she would have to take, you know, it's to go two miles. It took two hours because it was just horrible conditions until this one fabulous woman who knows the Obamas and the Clintons and you know all these administrators and had this glorious driver take her from here to there so but her experience is so opposite because she was the only white person mm. so it was very different in uh, in that regard um, not negative mm -hmm. but just different and mm -hmm. because she was American and she was also a minority because she's a Jewish girl. And that is also, they had never met a Jewish person before. And so that was an extraordinary thing. I find that all the time, being here, but being abroad for four months, studying in a very small little niche. So I applaud your experience, it's very interesting. My husband is from Ghana. Um, I want to say thank you because I've been scared to go. He wants to go. And I'm like, no, they're going to keep me. <laughs> He's like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not cool. And I'm like, well, my mom said, and my cousin said, and my friend said, and they said. He's like, no, they're not going to keep you. We're going to go. We're going to have a great time. Um, so we're planning to go. So I'm hoping for a good experience. Experience, um, and you're right with the man because all of his cousins go back, and boy, they treat them like so. Yeah, I'm going. <laughs> you will have you will have an amazing experience. Even though there was a travel barrier for me communicating with the men, I felt 100% completely safe at all times. One thing that I learned about them is that they are extremely protective and protective by any means necessary. We had buddies that were assigned to us that were natives to go with us. And me, I'm because I'm a veteran, you know, I feel a little privileged sometimes when I go places. So I was like, I'm, I'm okay, I'm safe. I know what to do if something happens. And they were like, no, no, no. <laughs> and, and they went everywhere, but I wasn't worried about anything. I felt completely, completely secure. And I feel like for African Americans, whether we're going to Africa, Dominica, Dominican Republic, we need to make sure that we are remaining, remaining educated. Mm -hmm. Staying educated and knowing that knowledge is extreme power. Each one teach one. Every black person that travels abroad, no matter where they go, we need to make sure that we are passing that knowledge on to the people, the friends and our families and our coworkers and educating them about what really is going on in other places and really challenging that narrative about traveling abroad because people are scared. That is the biggest reason why a lot of us do not travel because of fear. And if we continue to educate each other on our experiences, we can change that perception. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank everybody. And I would love to, again, have you in Nicaragua. <laughs> Thank you.